software has become ubiquitous to the modern workplace. So chances are, if you have a white collar job, on a daily basis you have to interact with one or more of these software tools. But there's a problem with these software tools. We all feel it, and on some level we're all aware of it, but we've grown so used to it we're not really talking much about it. What problem am I referring to? Well, to give you an idea, this is a picture of Microsoft Excel from 1995, and beside that is its most recent 2013 iteration. Almost 20 years have passed since we started a design paradigm of buttons along the tops of menus, toolbars. On the other end of the software tool spectrum, this is a picture of Photoshop from 1995 and its most recent 2013 iteration. They used a slightly darker gray, uh, but for the most part, the software tool has stayed more or less the same in its general design. But in 1995, when this design practice became conventional, computers had roughly eight megabytes of RAM. To put that in perspective, we now have around four gigabytes of RAM on your average laptop. That's a growth factor of approximately 500 within that time span. But what does 500 times growth look like? To give you an idea, this is what video games looked like in 1995. This is what video games look like now. It's staggering the difference 500 times can make. Yet we've seen <laughs> very little change with our software tools. Now that's not to say they haven't progressed, because they have, in leaps and bounds in terms of their functionality. But very little has been done in the way of design, the human interaction side of the software tool. It would seem we are thoroughly stuck in a design rut with our tools. But we can get out of this design rut, and by doing so, we stand to gain a new generation of software tools that are far more intuitive and more captivating to users. Well, what makes me think we can accomplish this? To give you some background, last semester I had the privilege of being an intern at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, before I go on, I know what you're thinking. Why doesn't he buy himself more than one fancy outfit? <laughs> to, to which I say, just because I'm giving a TED Talk doesn't mean my budget isn't any different from any other undergraduate student. <laughs> so. Moving on, uh, living the dream as far as a computer nerd like me was concerned. But while there, they had me working on a program that I would describe as unconventional, uh, even by computer science standards. Uh, my department's subject of study was these two buildings. We called them FRP 1 and 2. And these two buildings had hundreds of sensors throughout them that were constantly streaming in data to a large database that researchers would then look at and analyze. My job was loosely described to me as, make their analysis process fun and intuitive. To my great disappointment, at first, they, they didn't ask me to add in new functionality or to create some algorithm that could predict results. They wanted me to make something fun. <laughs> and at first, I didn't think this was either realistic or practical. I thought, it's data analysis. Right? It's not supposed to be fun. In fact, I'd say that's one of the defining characteristics of analysis <laughs> or anything else with the word data in it. And I thought even if I could make it fun, this is for researchers. They're not interested in fun. <laughs> they, they're interested in facts and truth and powerful tools that can get them there. They're not interested in some fun application I produce. But as my internship progressed, I began to see the relevance behind the type of work I was doing and I got a sense for what the future could be for our software tools. You see, this also happened to be my first ever white collar job. And I noticed as my internship was progressing that my energy levels would drop out after about half my work day. Little things began to take my attention away from me, like if my speakers were aligned just right, or if my chair was just the right height. And I imagine this phenomenon of unneeded chair adjustment Sounds familiar to many here. And I didn't used to be that way. 
I used to be able to focus for long stretches of time, and I used to be perfectly content with the height of my chair. So I began to look for the cause of my energy drain, of my loss of focus. I tried shifting around my diet, getting more sleep, but eventually I noticed the real problem was on the monitor that was in front of me every day. You see, the tool they were having me use to create this interactive database was an incredibly powerful one, but it was also, and not to be overly dramatic, but it was incredibly boring to work with. It could do a lot, but I struggled to do a lot with it as a result of how poor my user experience was with it. Not only that, but most of my time when I was able to muster up productivity wasn't spent actually working on my project. It was spent learning how to use the software tool and understand it. That was what my interactive database was for, was to combat this energy drain effect that takes place with dull software and turn time spent learning the software into time spent using it by making it intuitive. So with a renewed sense of relevance in my project and what I was doing, my mentors and I hunkered down, we finished it, and by the time we were done, we had converted what was initially screenfuls of text-based commands into an interactive virtual experience where they could run through virtual representations of the buildings and actually fire at sensors and the data would burst in front of them. By the time we were done, we had packed in sound effects, texture packs, and instead of walking upstairs from level to level, we made it so they could fly. Any anything and everything we could do to enhance their user experience was packed into this thing. And when we allowed researchers to demo it for the first time, it actually put a smile on their face. An analysis tool that put a smile on faces. I've seen grown men and women with PhDs giggle as they fly around their favorite <laughs> facilities. That's the power our software tools can have if we are willing and brave enough to get out of this design rut that we've created. So, as an example, I imagine many here, uh, like me, half your work day's gone, and you're fighting back the urge to fall asleep. It doesn't need to be this way. We can fix this by engineering tools that take into account the fact that you're a human with an attention span and an energy level and an emotional state, all of which are incredibly relevant to how productive you can be in what you're doing. And what our software tools can do is important, but what is arguably more important is what users can do with these software tools. If your software tool is twice as efficient as the next guy's, it doesn't matter if users can only stand to use it for half the amount of time. The design task for developers would be a large one, but the growth in productivity and engagement of employees could be immeasurable. Similarly, I imagine many here have been curious about a software tool, whether it was graphic design or video editing, maybe even programming, but the, the largeness of the time investment necessary to even become competent with this tool was so great, it discouraged you from ever pursuing that creative avenue. We can fix this by working to engineer more intuitive tools. In 1995, those type of features weren't feasible and we didn't have the computer resources to support them. We've since grown by a factor of 500. It is now very possible. And again, the design task for developers is a large one but they would stand to gain a whole new user base of casual users, people who are just curious about the tool, not necessarily professionals who do it because they have to. Similarly, I bet many here have booted up a piece of software at some point, and just on startup, as soon as it booted up, you were lost on what to do next. I'd also bet many of you then did something along the lines of blaming it on yourself saying something like, well, I'm just not good with computers. What if I told you it's not your fault, but it's the fault of design practices that are nearly two decades old now, and very little has been done in between now and then to improve on how easy these are to learn. And with our aging workforce that is frequently struggling to stay relevant in our rapidly shifting economy, 
One of the best things we can do for them, arguably, is to engineer tools that are easier for them to learn, that gets them reintegrated back into the workforce, that doesn't presuppose they've already been using the tool for a decade. So there's more than a user experience on the line. There are livelihoods. These software tools are a large part of what makes our society tick. So let's work to bring them into the 21st century and realize their potential. Let's get out of this design rut, be brave, take a fresh look at what our software is attempting to accomplish. And maybe, just maybe, our next batch of software tools won't be designed for a rare few professionals, but they'll be designed for all of us. So the next time you're sitting at your desk bored, or you've booted up a piece of software and you're frustrated and confused, remember, it doesn't need to be this way. We can do better, and this can be fixed. Thank you.